Um, in the context of our story, Judah, right, has been sacked by Babylon, and they're asking the question, hey, Babylon is evil too. What about them? Are you going to judge them, right? So we're getting into a section called the judgment of the nations, right? I'm not going to cover chapter 52. It's the last chapter because it's a historical narrative of what happened. I've been sharing with you what happened. It's the destruction of Jerusalem, and they're taken off into, they're deported. You're welcome to read that. But we're going to start in chapter 46 today. And the big idea today is that God judges nations, and it's for the purpose of restoration. It's always for the purpose of restoration. So God just loves all nations, and the only reason he judges them is for the purpose of restoring them. This is a very powerful passage because it's prophetic and it's poetic. It's prophetic and it's poetic. And so with precision, God predicts what is going to happen. With a list of other nations, these things actually happened. You can trust that God is sovereign over the affairs of men. So God is sovereign even now within history. The, um, the demonstrations on college campuses about Hamas, all these things that you feel might be out of control are not out of control. God is fully in control. He's sovereign over the nations, and he's beautifully working to help restore people back to himself. Yesterday, I talked with my uh, neighbor, Roger, or on Friday morning, I talked with him, and uh, he's fairly new in our cul-de-sac. Roger rides around with a buggy. He's in his 60s, has a big beard. I can't tell what his face looks like. Seems like a nice guy. And so Roger and I were talking yesterday, and he shared with me, that he was in and out of prison multiple times, drug addiction, and he was a thief. So he would go in and steal things and stuff, and then he'd land in prison and come out. And there was a pastor who was after him for 20 years, and he was like, Roger, I'm going to get you, man. You're going to come to Jesus. And so he would just pray for him and go for 20 years. And then Roger told me that uh, a tractor trailer, there was an accident in an intersection. He was laying on the ground, and a tractor trailer drove over his leg, and so he lost his leg from his hip down. And these are the words that he said to me on Friday. He said, Bobby, I want you to know that um, God, I believe that God allowed this in my life to get my attention. And I believe I would just continue bumbling with drug addiction and stealing things. I would be in and out of prison, but he got my attention. And it changed my life. And my wife, Kelly, and I are believers. Um, Last week, I got to lead someone else to Jesus. So he was telling me about that. It was just beautiful to see that through a tragedy, God had actually beautifully restored Roger to be this amazing guy. And he's looking forward to heaven when he's going to have his, both his legs, right? So that's Roger. The idea today is that God does judge nations, but it's, it's clinical, it's surgical, and always for the purpose of restoration. Um, so Judah is asking, hey, we're being judged. What about Babylon? So we're going to go into this dialogue about Um, the nations um, surrounding um, Israel, okay? And then the question of Babylon is going to come up in chapters 50 and 51. Let's take, um, let's take the nations. This is, go- this is going to feel a little bit um, heady for you. Uh, so we're going to list them. I'll summarize them for you. But if you can pay attention just to walk through the list of these nations, I'll do my best uh, for you today. So Jeremiah 46 starts out with the idea of um, the judgment concerning the nations. And then he says, we're going to start with Egypt. Egypt uh, was judged at the decisive battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. Um, they, they, they ceased to be a significant force at that point, And God used Babylon to crush them. Now, why was Egypt crushed? It says in our passage today that Egypt rises like the Nile. So they were swollen this imagery of a river swollen with pride that says, I'm going to rise and I'm going to cover the earth. I'm going to destroy the inhabitants. And they prided themselves in being cattle ranchers. So the heifer, the beautiful heifer, is going to be bit by by a fly. That's what what it says. And um, so they they worshipped cattle. That's why um, Israel, when they were in the wilderness, worshipped a golden calf. They had that idea uh, from, from the Egyptians. And so it's interesting that um, the restoration comes later on when God says afterward, um, Egypt will be inhabited again, right? And, and that God restores them as a nation. And even in Isaiah chapter 19, blessed 
are, be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, my handiwork. It's just beautiful to see that um, God loves the Egyptian people. When Jen and I were in Austria, uh, she went to language school, and one of the couples were Egyptian, and they came to our house. And it's beautiful um, to meet um, Christians who are Egyptian. God loves um, the Egyptian people. Um, the Philistines, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, they worshiped um, Dagon, the fish god. So if you uh, remember um, that Goliath was one of the Philistines, right? And they were always fighting against the Jewish people. And they, they prided themselves in their wealth and their prosperity from the sea. And God um, chose to judge them. I liked verse 6, says, the sword of the Lord, how long until you are quiet? Okay, so Jeremiah is getting the description of the slashing and the judging of the Philistines. And he says, how long? How long, God, is this sword of God going to be judging them? And the answer is like, until the work is accomplished that needs to be accomplished. When I read the word sword of the Lord, it reminded me of a description that the Bible is a double-edged sword, right? And that the warnings go out and the judgment of God um, goes out and says, hey, the Spirit of God is there to convict um, the nations and people. And if they don't listen to this sword, then the physical sword begins to come. How long, how long until it's accomplished? Well, until God has done um, the work that he has set out to do. So that's a word in chapter 47 on the Philistines. Chapter 48, Moab. Um, Moab was just on the east side of, um, of uh, the Dead Sea. So if you, there are surrounding nations there and Moab um, is the purple one just, just on the other side of the Dead Sea. It's a modern day Jordan. And um, Moab, it says in verse six, to flee and to save yourselves. For because you trusted in your works and in your treasures, um, you also shall be taken. And so they really prided themselves in their works, in their reputation, in the, in the security of their treasure, right? And um, it reminded me, Moab reminds me a little bit of Lancaster County. Some of you have a story where you grew up going to church and you were told um, you need to act a certain way and I'm going to do these things and then I get accolades and I'm accepted in culture. And so you, you kind of impose that into your relationship with God and you have this assumption you have to rely on your works so that God accepts you, all right? And your reason for um, doing your good works is to gain the favor of God. It's really a self-centered contractual relationship you have with God. That's not the gospel. Um, God um, says your works are like filthy rags. Your, your condition is way worse than you would have thought. You're filled with pride. You don't really love the Father. I know of my own testimony. I don't love God the way I ought to love God. Often I do the good things just for what it, it would give me. And they, they learn to rely on their works and on their treasures, right? Now, how did, how did it get to that point? Moab is described here, and it says, Moab has been at ease from his youth and has settled on his dregs. He has not been emptied from vessel to vessel. This is saying that Moab began to rely on their works and on their treasures because they have always been at ease. They've never been shaken up. There's not really been a shaking for them to show them, hey, you don't really love God. You're just doing your own thing and relying on your works and your treasures. And the imagery is brought in how you would purify wine. So wine is purified by, back then by pouring it from one vessel to another vessel and the dregs settle down and then they're removed because the impurities and the dregs in wine would actually spoil the taste of the wine. And so the imagery is here that um, Moab has not been shaken up, okay? They have not been shaken, and so the dregs have just settled in them, and it begins to spoil the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of what God is doing in your life because you're really relying on yourself. There's been no shakeup. And so it's interesting, the judgment is described against Moab, and then you find out in verse 47, yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab. And it's, Jordan is a beautiful country um, today. There are believers in Jordan. Our denomination has an incredible mission um, uh, that they're doing in Jordan. There are actual CMA churches in, in Jordan, and it's, it's amazing. All right, let's go on to Ammon. Um, this is what God says about Ammon. Why then has Milcom dispossessed Gad and his has settled in its cities. I will cause the battle cry. And so once again, 
uh, on this image, um, Ammon is, uh, is on the um, east side of the Jordan River. And um, what we know about this story is that there are two tribes of Israel that settle on the east side. What are the names of the two tribes? Do any of you know that? Gad and Reuben. That's correct. Gad and Reuben. They settled on the east side. And that was part of the inheritance that you, this is going to be part of the promised land and you can settle over here. Interesting that um, the god of Ammon, uh, Milcom, has dispossessed Gad. So this becomes a story of dispossessing God's people from their inheritance. Okay, So what that makes me think of is if you're a born-again Christian and you give, um, you give room to some foreign god, you're trusting in something else besides the living God. Something becomes your functional savior. Um, it can be money, sex, power, control. It can be comfort, security. We've talked about these things. You give up territory, right? And so um, this is the idea of dispossessing this land that God has given you to enjoy, to enjoy that relationship with God. And the lesson for the believer in here is don't, um, don't give up what God has given to you. So let me just describe that briefly from this idea of Ammon. People can fall into the category of being self-reliant, like Moab, or into self-rejection, like in the story of Ammon. Self-rejection. And I think one of the greatest enemies of your Christian faith is what we would call self-rejection. Well, what is that? It is that in your journey, somewhere along the line, you've given up ground, and then you feel so um, ashamed from Satan and from, what, and from failures and things that you struggle with self-rejection. So you might come to church and you say, oh man, th those people are worshiping God and I can watch that, but it's not for me, right? I'm, I'm like a problem child. And that's not the gospel. That's not, if, if you're here today and you've put your faith in Jesus, that's how you receive the Holy Spirit, not by works of the law, according to Galatians chapter three. And so you can trust God in that. It's not um, th so th this becomes a story of like, hey, don't let Milcom come and take your inheritance that God has given you in Christ, all right? Ammon uh, comes in, and they're going to be judged. It's listed there. And then afterward, I will restore the fortunes of the Ammonites, and God restores the Ammonites. It's beautiful. It's also part of modern-day Jordan. The next one is the Edomites. Um, they um, are also known as Esau, the descendants of Esau. That's um, Israel's foolish cousin, okay, Esau, and uh, has, has wisdom departed from Esau and just the idea I've uncovered the hiding places. They lived more in an arid territory where they could hide in the rocks. And Petra was known as one of those hiding places. No one can come in and conquer us here. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to trust in, in, our, uh, in being able to hide in these rocks. And then Damascus is listed um, and that God is going to judge Damascus, referring to Syria, and they were crushed by the Babylonians. Uh, Damascus prided themselves in being the beautiful city, so many people would come there um, because of the reputation of Damascus, every delight of humankind, and it was a deceiving kind of happiness in Damascus. They prided themselves in all the wonderful delights that they had. Then the nomads are brought up, um, Kedar and Hazar. Kedar are nomads who would be out in the, in the open, in the land somewhere, and then um, the nomads that would end up settling in a city were the people of Hazor, and, and Nebuchadnezzar took them as well. Um, these remind me of those of you who want to live off-grid, <laughs> get your little, you know, I'm going to buy my little mobile whatever and have that solar panel and, and water filters, and hey, I'm going to live off-grid. Well, the Babylonians reached them as well, and they were, they were trusting and relying on being nomads. And then Elam, in chapter 49, would be uh, modern-day Iran. Those are the Persians, all right? And the Bible says that um, they, um, God is going to break the bow of Elam. So what's known about Elam was their military might, especially in archery. So they prided themselves in being able to be really decisive in battle using archery. And God says, I'm going to break their bow. He lists um, the judgments against the Elamites. And then later we find out in the latter days, I will restore the fortunes of Elam. And it's beautiful. In Acts chapter 2, when people receive the Spirit of God, the Elamites are mentioned. 
that God restores them. And I've had the chance to talk to many Iranians who have accepted Christ when I was in Austria. The story is you, they come to know Christ and then um, they're, um, they're in danger of being um, executed so they'll escape and they go to Turkey secretly on vacation and that's where they can get baptized in Turkey and then they usually come up into Europe. And so it's been amazing to talk to Iranian Christians and how God loves the people in Iran. And so I will restore the Iranians. So let me just give you the list here. Good job, guys. It's kind of been a little bit heady, but here's the list for you. We have the ranchers who are swollen uh, with their own pride, uh, the Philistines who worship wealth from the sea, uh, Moab trusts in their works and their wealth, um, Ammon dispossesses Gad and, and says Milcom is the true God, um, Edom um, prides themselves in being able to hide in their fortresses like Petra, um, Damascus, the beautiful city uh, of delights, um, Kedar and Hazar, the self-reliant nomads, Elam, military might. Do you get a sense that there are different nuances here of what people do and what people trust in as a replacement to the living God? Do you get a sense of that? What is it? Where do you identify? And what are you trusting in today? What, what is God shoulder tapping on you and saying, hey, I'm trusting in, in these things and I, I need to just be careful to, to trust God as the living God. And I think it's just beautiful that actually in this scenario, God, um, Keller references there are the two cities, the, um, the earthly city and then the city of God. And for the earthly city, people can go into the earthly city and live in Babylon, in modern day Babylon, and you can use money and power and sex and, and you can use the city for your own purposes. But God actually sent Israel into Babylon and he said, I know the plans I have for you. And then he says, um, settle into the city. Um, connect with your neighbors. Pray for the city. Intermarry. Bless the city. And I just have a sense that God has sent us into Babylon to bless the city. And if there are people who have different persuasions that you have, um, if there are different political angles, if there are different um, social uh, groups in this city in Babylon, God has brought the believer here to bless the city, to pray for the city, to love the city. And believers did that in Rome after they were persecuted, and half the Roman Empire turns to Jesus because they saw the, the beauty and the character of um, those who trusted in the true and living God. All these other gods just collapse over time. So, the idea today is that God actually judges the nations, but it's for the purpose of restoration. He wants to restore the nations. Let's get into the, our final part on the question of Babylon. Who is Babylon? And, and God, are you going to judge Babylon? And, and what does that look like for us? All right. You guys ready? We're going to do this. This is concerning Babylon. Babylon is taken, Bel is put to shame, Merodach is dismayed, her images are put to shame, her idols are dismayed. Bel Merodach was the big god, the divine guardian of the empire. Even Daniel, when he came in to Babylon, was, called, was given a new name, bel Tajar. Um, and, and so the, the word Bel or their god was placed in front of his name and he, he came in there and so Belshazzar was like, he, he was the guardian. Bel Merodach was the guardian of the empire. He was like the Zeus, the one that you would, that you would um, look to as, as the ultimate um, god. And the Hebrew word here, um, she's put to shame, and then her, Im her images are put to shame. That word images, the, the Hebrew um, root word of that, galal, images, has two meanings. It means idols, and it means balls of excrement or balls of poop. And so it's like God is mocking them right now. And he's saying, your idols are put to shame. They're like balls of poop. Like you guys think you're this great, amazing empire. Um, you're nothing. Like you're just going to be put to shame. I am the God of the universe. I'm the creator. And everything that you're worshiping is just a plastic toy. It's nothing. It's worthless. But it's so beautiful that in Psalm 87, you find out, I will record Babylon among those who know me. It's beautiful that we hear in the story that many people in Babylon actually um, came to know the true and living God through Daniel and other believers who were there. It's incredible to see that even in judgment, God restores Babylon. 
But God judges them. And so you get a whole list in chapter 50 and 51 of the judgment against Babylon. And even when the judgment hits, like the challenge is to flee from Babylon, that you should, you should flee and, and to raise a shout against her. Her walls are thrown down. And, and so I ask myself the question here, what is Babylon here? Because um, as you start to go through, the list starts talking about things that are bigger than, than um, just Babylon of what, what, you would, that, what you would see from just back then. So here's one example. The walls of Babylon in the judgment of Babylon back then were not thrown down. So is this talking about a different Babylon? What happened? So back then, we have a historical account and a biblical account. In 536 BC, the Persian army um, was on the rise and Cyrus was uh, the, the new, uh, he was the new guy in town. And, and what was happening during this time is um, if you read, you've, this has been on the History Channel, or if you read about Babylon, they had three massive walls surrounding the city that were 40 feet high, and they would have chariot races on the tops of the walls. It was huge. It's like nobody can conquer Babylon. Babylon was known as the hammer of the nations. They would come in and just crush nations, and then these people would want to come back and avenge themselves. Babylon was like just so protected, right? And the king of Babylon was having a drunken and a sexual party um, inside of the walls of Babylon. And you, do you know what the Persian army had been doing for, for more than a year before that? They were literally rerouting the river that flowed under the city. They literally made it into a swamp. They were, they were digging by hand little tributaries to reroute the river. And slowly the water level started coming down, down, down. And the Persian army went underneath the walls and sacked Babylon. There's a biblical account and also a historical account of that. So what are these walls? Her walls are thrown down. It made me very curious. And I asked the question, what is Babylon? What is being talked about? In Genesis, Babel is brought up. It's the first time we as humans attempted to replace God. Then in Daniel's prophecy, um, Babylon is just the head of the statue, but then you have other world empires, and today it's a mixed empire of iron and clay in the feet that is going to be crushed by the rock Christ that comes in, okay? So that's an, a reference to Babylon. And then Revelation 17 and 18 is a reference to Babylon the Great that's going to be crushed. So what is Babylon, and how can I understand it? So then it made me curious, and I started to compare some of the description in Jeremiah 51 with Revelation 17 and 18. And I found out that um, in, in, there's similarities here. It, it's the golden cup that is making the nations, the kings of the earth, drunk. So we drink of the idols of Babylon and it controls us. Um, it's suddenly fallen. You are, when you see judgment come, you're to flee or forsake. Um, it's the, Babylon, the one that dwells by the many waters. Um, it's rich in treasures. You see the smoke of her rising up. The broad wall is going to be leveled. Okay? And then in both instances, um, Jeremiah is asked to do this, and then John um, um, cites this, is that a rock is, is um, sunk in, in, in the water to show that Babylon will sink. And I thought it was interesting. Both of those are illustrated. Jeremiah is asked to do that, and then uh, so is John to talk about this millstone that's going to sink. So when I read that, I thought, there's something in Jeremiah 51 that is bigger than just what happened historically. There's something big here. And I started to realize that Babylon the Great is actually the key empire that's influencing humankind as a replacement of God. So Babylon is whatever uh, empire is, is, is um, the key influencer of culture. And I started to think of the United States and of Europe and how influential the English language has been and how, of how influential our culture has been. If you go to foreign countries, they translate our movies. It's so funny to watch a dubbed movie, and you'll see their mouth moving in English, and then you have the foreign nation's uh, words on there, and that the U.S. has had an incredible influence on other nations, and that um, Europe and the U.S. are economic leaders and influencers. So what, who is Babylon today? So I started to read some more in Revelation 18, and it says... The merchants of the earth weep. This is in the destruction of Babylon. No one buys their cargo anymore. It lists all the luxuries and the slaves of human souls that were brought into Babylon. Revelation 18 
All the shipmasters and seafaring men and sailors, all who trade in the sea, stood far off and cried as they saw the smoke of the city go up and burn, right? And so people come in with their cargo, and they can no longer deliver because the city has gone up in smoke. And then in Revelation 18, 24, uh, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on earth. And that's when I realized that um, the USA is not Babylon, according to this description, because the USA has not yet shed the blood of prophets and saints. The USA does not have a history of martyring Christians at this point, okay? Babylon does. And so this um, could be somewhere in the future. We don't know. We don't have the timeline. But this is a description of the destruction of Babylon and what Babylon did as a key influencer and then what that looks like. So it's interesting to me when I look at that that um, there, is, um, there, are, there are nations that are key influencers that we're told to be in the city, to live in Babylon, uh, to, to influence Babylon with our character, um, not to use the city for money, sex, and power, but to live in Babylon as an influencer, right? And then that at some point, God is going to judge Babylon for the purpose of restoring Babylon, I want to close with this imagery um, that really stuck out to me in in Jeremiah chapter 50. Um, It's this idea that God judges nations for the purpose of restoration. And now watch, God did judge Babylon back then. And this is what happened to Israel. Um, They come together weeping as they come and they shall seek the Lord their God. They They shall ask the way to Zion with faces turned toward it saying, come Let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will never be forgotten. Now watch this. God judges nations. And as you can see here, the nation of Israel responds beautifully and they start asking the question, where is the way to Zion? I I want to know God. I'm hungry for God. And that through the judgment, people start asking questions. Where is God? I want to know God. Have any of you ever uh, wrestled to share the gospel with someone else in your neighborhood or in your workplace, and you want to tell them about Jesus, and they blow you off, or they don't care, or they don't want to listen, they judge you or whatever, and they're just kind of stiff arm? Well, it's incredible to think that after judgment, People become so soft and pliable. And I want to hear from God. I want to hear from God. And it's beautiful to see what God does in that. So I want to um, close with just two practical steps in this. The first one is that if you're in the room today or you're listening online and you have not yet accepted Christ as your personal Savior, I just want you to know that God loves you. And that, um, yeah, in the future, there may be some judgments that are going to come. The Bible even talks of the rapture of the church. And if you're not a believer and this world leader starts coming in and, 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 and things start getting hot, don't take the number of the beast. Accept Jesus Christ. You'll go through a difficult time. But put your faith in Jesus Christ and uh, you'll be born again. I would actually challenge you to do that now before the church is taken out. I would encourage you to put your faith in Jesus Christ now because there are only two places where the wrath of God strikes. On people who don't know God and on the cross of Jesus Christ. The wrath of God struck the cross, his own son, to create a covering for you. Don't trust in your works. Don't trust in your treasures. Don't trust in whatever that thing is that you tend to go to, right, for stress relief or whatever, but to trust in the living God. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you can accept him. You can say, Jesus, I believe now. I, I know. I understand who you are. Come into my life and save me, and he will respond to that, all right? The second thing that I want to challenge you is that if you're a believer, that God is, I believe God is calling the church right now and he's, he's sifting through the church, all right? And he's cleansing the church. And I believe that he's, he's revealing things that you're, you're relying on, that you're trusting in. 
And as he turns up the heat, he's saying, you can trust me. I am entirely trustworthy. Look at, look at Jeremiah. Look at the courage that he had and how God continued to rescue him and, and provide for him, provide good things for him. You can trust me in the chaos. That's why I encourage you to memorize Psalm 23 last week, where I would say, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. I have everything that I need, and to press into that. I loved what Sarah Young uh, said, walk with me in holy trust, responding to my initiatives rather than trying to make things fit your plans. I died to set you free. When your mind spins with a multitude of thoughts, you can't hear my voice. Turn from this idolatry back to me and listen to me and live abundantly. All right? Let's pray together. Thank you, God, that you judge the nations for the purpose of restoration. Thank you that we get to see uncovered false gods and false things that we rely on. And we pray today that you'd continue to guide us to rely fully on you, God, to trust you. And we believe that you're here in this space today and that you love us. And we just want to confess to you, God, that sometimes we don't rely on you. Sometimes we don't trust you. We don't listen for your voice. We ask that you guide us in that. Just take a moment to just pray quietly and, and talk to Jesus about what you've heard just for a minute. And then I'll close. Jesus, we pray that you would cleanse your church. That we would trust you completely in, in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.